you in wrestling what it's all about and trying to figure out what is the nature of reality. One has to start with time. And I hear a lot of things about time, but I want to get back to bedrock. What is time? Robert, I think when we ask that question, we need to distinguish two elements. We need to distinguish the question, what is our ordinary conception of time from the question, what is physics conception of time? Okay, that's a great way to put the question because there's a, a lot of conflict between the two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and one of the things, I think this is one of the things where philosophers like, like me can, can make some contribution to the debate is in helping to pull these two things apart. Okay, let's so if go. we could focus first on, on this, the subjective, ordinary idea of time. Right. I think there, there are three main elements that, that we can distinguish and that it's important to distinguish because any one of the three or any combination of the three might turn out to be what we need in physics yeah, as objective right, right. time. Okay. So one element is the idea that the, the present moment is somehow special. Some people claim that the present moment is all that exists. The past doesn't exist. Yeah. The future doesn't exist. The second element is the idea that there's some kind of flow or, or passage or change, that, that time is somehow essentially dynamic. And then the third element is that there's some deep distinction between the past and the future, so that time has a direction in that sense. And often those last two things are linked together. Sure. So the idea is that the flow itself has a direction. Right. But in principle, you could pull them apart. You can imagine a view where time was essentially dynamic, there was, there was a flow, but it didn't matter whether you thought of that flow going in one direction or the other. Okay, got it. The three things, the specialness of now, time has a flow, and a difference between past and exactly. future. Exactly. Okay. So once we've got there, then the really interesting question, I think, is whether any of those three elements should be part of the physics, or whether we should regard all three of them as being in, in somehow subjective, something that, that we humans project onto the world. In other words, an artifact of our own minds reading into the world, but, but, but doesn't exist in reality. Exactly. Like so color. Something like, like color or, or taste. Or, right, right. I mean, physics is known or has believed since the 17th century, people like Galileo, that those sorts of things were somehow subjective. As Galileo says, they, they have their residence solely in the sensitive body, uh, not out there in the world. Uh, and so the, quest the interesting questions about time, I think, at least from a philosopher's point of view, are whether any of those three elements are, whether they are like color and taste or whether any of them are out there in the objective world. Right. And it seems to me the right answer, as far as we can tell from physics, is the, the extreme answer that none of them are in, in the objective world. So fundamental physics seems to provide certainly provides no, no basis for the idea that there's a privileged, special, present moment. Um, it seems to have nothing corresponding to, to the flow or passage of time. And at a deep level, it, it seems to recognize no important distinction between the past and the future. So on all three, yeah, you're saying on so. all three of those elements of time in which we are so grounded that seem so obvious, None of them are, are present in fundamental physics. Exactly. I think that's, that's the way the evidence is going. But the, it's kind of scary. It is kind of scary. Um, and, and one of the things that, I mean, if that's right, then one of the things that follows on from it is that physicists need to be very careful that in thinking about the world, they're not slipping in one of those subjective elements into the way in which they theorize about the world. So you're interested in protecting physicists from us normal people as opposed to protecting us normal people from those physicists. Well, I'm in interested in, in helping physicists sort of pr protect themselves from themselves in <laughs> a sense, uh, by, by he helping to draw that distinction that we talked about before between what's, what's um, subjective, what, what, what just comes from us, and what's really out there in the world. Uh, are you worried, though, that, that I in the physics they may be um, that there may be something in our perceptions that the, the physicists are missing in their descriptions? No, I, th I think the danger goes the other way. Okay. I think the danger is that the, the physicists are trying to put something into the, their descriptions which, which simply comes. So, so what are the implications of that? I, I, let's take it both ways. The implications, obviously, if they incorporate something that uh, is, is from their own perception into their physics, they'll get their physics messed up. We don't want that. But uh, what is the implication if the there's nothing in the physics that is uh, that corresponds to our three notions of time. 
Well, the the implication, I mean, it's conceivable, I think, that there could be rich implications for physics um, in the sense that perhaps, for example, a future physics might, might allow more room for the idea that we should explain things in terms of what happens in the future rather than in terms of what happens in the past. In other words, n n not, uh, not so much respecting our sense of past being gone and future yet to come. Exactly, the, exactly. The, 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 the absolute distinction between them, because that's our perceptions. Exactly. So what you're saying is physicists, if, 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 they, if they remove their, their biases, their human biases, they may be able to understand more about the nature of causation or how things happen. Yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, just to make it a little bit more specific, what I had in mind was that in ordinary life, and this is a manifestation of our ordinary uh, subjective perspective in my view, in ordinary life we, we always explain things in terms of what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me conceivable once, we, once we've treated all three of these things as part of the subjective side rather than part of the objective side, that we could then be open to the possibility that some things in physics need to be explained by how things are in the future rather than how things are in the past. So, so we, that would be a kind of liberation because it would liberate physics to look for a different kind of explanation in certain places. And that, the most likely places for that to happen, I think, are either on the very large scale yeah. in, in, in cosmology, especially cosmology which is looking at the possibility that the observable uni universe as we know it expanding from the Big Bang is simply a small part of something much bigger. Um, and then down at the microscopic level uh, in quantum mechanics uh, where there are interesting approaches to quantum mechanics which turn on the idea that the state of a, of a particle, say a photon or an electron, does depend on what happens to it in the future as well as on what happens to How it could time. our subjective human understanding be so far wrong then? Because, well, th think of a, a comparable question. Think of our ancestors confronted with the idea that the world might be a sphere rather than a flat plane. They might ask themselves, how could we be so wrong in thinking that up and down was a fundamental feature of reality? And, and we know the answer to that question. Well, we could be so wrong because we live in an environment in which it's extremely important. And in the case of time, we can be so wrong because we are highly temporally asymmetric creatures or structures in a region of the universe in which um, there, there is a striking temporal asymmetry of, of the thermodynamic kind. Um, and so, but, as in the case of up and down, it would simply be a matter of recognition that something we took to be a general feature of the universe is actually just a sort of local feature of our environment.